Yeah. Hello, dear participants. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the fifth webinar of the series Beyond the Museums. It's already the fifth uh, time that we meet together, uh, almost approaching to the half of the training course. So we started uh, uh, by mapping, by providing some approaches for mapping cultural heritage. Uh, we started with uh, the definition of uh, extended museums and how to approach, how to promote water heritage in the different territories. Then we moved with the second and then the third webinar to uh, explore uh, other approaches and other notions with uh, ancestral hydro technologies, uh, which also are um, kind of heritage which deserve our attention and promotion. We moved to rural and urban waterscapes, and then uh, we uh, we are approaching today another, let's say, important. Uh, aspect of this uh, webinar series with the participatory approaches. Uh, the last webinar was a bit different from the previous one, from the previous ones as we had uh, different uh, speakers, not only representative of the academia and science researchers, but also artists. And uh, the title was uh, um, uh, Water Walks, and it was already um, a first approach to participation to engage local communities through these uh, explorations of uh, rivers and local hydrographies made by researchers and artists. So today we have two more, two new distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, I leave the grant to Sara Lucchetta for making the formal presentations and starting today by analyzing more in depth how we can engage local communities, how participatory approaches are a new dimension for water museums, a dimension that deserve uh, a proper representation to take into account uh, the view also of local people, local communities. So please, Sara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eriberto. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you again for being here with us for the fifth appointment of this webinar series. And uh, as Roberto already said, the keyword of today is participation, which is one of the key dimensions that we would like to, to highlight in our training course and uh, in, the, in the quest for, uh, for methodologies and tools for valuing water heritage. So we are going to start with the first speaker, which I am very glad to introduce, which is uh, Dr. Giulio Castelli, that is an environmental engineer currently working on multiple research projects in East Africa, Central and South America. Giulio holds a PhD in sustainable management of agricultural forestry and food resources from the University of Florence. During his PhD, he focused on water harvesting, water resources management, and participatory approaches in international development. Alongside his PhD, he worked for the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation in Sudan. He is currently appointed as Research Fellow in Agricultural in Hydraulics and Watershed Protection at the University of Florence in Italy, Water Harvesting Lab. So today, Dr. Castelli will speak about participatory approaches for traditional and enhanced water management practices. So as usual, if you have any questions during the intervention by Dr. Castelli, please just write them in the chat box or you will be able to react with them with, by raising your hand after the intervention, and we will be very glad to give you the floor to pose the questions after the intervention. So, um, Giulio, thank you very much. The floor is yours. 
Hello everyone and thank you Sara and Roberto for this introduction, very much appreciated. And, and thank you for the invitation to this, uh, I think, very, very interesting uh, online course. So as uh, Sara mentioned, I'm basically an environmental engineer, uh, mostly an hydraulic engineer. This means that I work with water, but what basically with with a proactive approach. So I'm I'm not a social scientist. I'm I'm not working with uh, museums, uh, but I worked with uh, communities and with traditional water management practices. So I, I try to bridge uh, the gap uh, between my um, experience and and the goal of this course. And I hope this might be of interest for the course and, and I think also the discussion would be very, very useful to, to try to, to merge my approach and the, the overall uh, topic of the course. So the, my, my lesson will be on participatory approaches for traditional and enhanced water management practices and I'm focusing on participatory approaches to uh, researching these practices so to to work with the uh, local communities in every context uh, to discover the everyday uh, practice of uh, these uh, water management practices that they have also uh, a traditional and an heritage uh, function but uh, they are still working today so it's something that we can, uh, I mean, display in a museum, but it is also something real, something that is still today occurring. And, and this is also connected to my research topics because uh, I do research in agricultural engineering, but with these kind of practices. So these kind of approaches are, are very important for me. I would like to start uh, giving some uh, beginners uh, or, or, I mean, basically definition about participation. Maybe this is uh, a little bit uh, obvious for many of you, but uh, how we define participation, this is very important. So participation is uh, merely the fact that you take part or become involved in something. This definition does not explain how much you are involved and for which reason. So this, this is a very important point. So you have different degree of participation. And what I'm discussing today is participatory research. That is a specific type of participation. So if you look a little bit the definitions uh, about um, participation, you see that, uh, first of all, it is a very broad concept. So if you, if you say that participation is to be involved in something, it, it can be everything. It can be that, that you are involved uh, uh, for, uh, I mean, being informed about a decision on, on land management, but it can also mean that you are involved for actually take the decision. And participation means different things to different people. Of course, it's a term that uh, it is used by people with different ideological approaches. And this is why it takes different meanings. So in, in a very short phrase, you don't have only one kind of participation because uh, in general terms, uh, there are different uh, meanings. You have to agree on how you define participation, whom it is expected to involve, and what, what you expect to achieve, and how you bring this decision about participation into the common place of work. Here, here you find a little bit uh, uh, of, of uh, basic literature about this definition that I gave. And uh, probably the, the most uh, simple but yet clear way to 
define the different levels of participation is this very famous diagram uh, with it, it basically called the participatory ladder that defines at which level you do participation. So you can start uh, really doing participation for manipulation or therapy of the people who participate in a process. So some way, some way, in some approaches, you make people participate for becoming in favor of, of one decision. So this is still conceived as participation, but uh, on a different ideological point of view, you can say that this is non-participation. So you involve people just to make them agree with you. They don't have decision power. Then you have different, uh, different levels. So you, you can do participation just for informing. That is, of course, uh, at a different political level, because you inform people, you allow them to make their own um, ideas about the things that are happening, even though you don't uh, uh, basically allow them to decide. And while you step up uh, on the ladder, you see that uh, more and more and more, uh, you can give uh, um, right to people to participate so they the basically the last degree of the ladder they are the the one that are defined as degrees of citizen power meaning when you allow the people that participate to actually became part of a decision making process and and this is uh, this is another version maybe a little bit more uh, colorful of, of uh, the, the letter, but if you Google participatory letter, you basically find uh, with different uh, layouts and, and different maybe steps, basically the same concept. So uh, if you talk about participation, you are talking uh, on a very, very vogue and general term and, and different people may give to participation different meaning. So it's very important that you may clear especially how much you want people to participate because some people they may consider participation good because it's an instrument to achieve their own decision while some some people may consider participation good because it helps to take better decision with the involvement of actors that have a decision making process and and i'm not giving uh, any a judgment about uh, this uh, this use of participation but I'm, i just want to make clear that basically you have different meanings and you may give, give different meanings to participation and now let's come to participatory research so what is participatory research participatory research is not participation Okay, we are not uh, um, dealing anymore with the general uh, use of participation. That might be I don't know, participation for taking a decision about building something or manage something in a certain way. If we do participatory research, we just, just in brackets, uh, discuss about doing research on something together for taking uh, better decisions. So this is quite a nice uh, definition. So participatory research methods uh, um, are methods that we use to conduct the research process with people uh, um, whose life world are under study. And in, in this definition, we, which I like, uh, you see um, why participatory research is a little bit different and in, in a certain case is shifting to the very higher uh, steps of the ladder. Uh, when you do participatory research, you do not research uh, with your own mindset only. You do not give uh, the meaning uh, to things only with, with your categories, but you involve the people of that, that you are researching as active parts of the research. 
So you allow them to introduce their way of, of doing research or some, on something in your research uh, process. I, I will give you some information about this, but I mean, I just want to make clear the point, I will give a very rough example. So doing participatory research does not mean that, that you do research on people, but it does mean that you do research together with people, meaning that people themselves are actors of the research and that they can decide how you make the research. And, and this is another definition, uh, maybe I like this one more than the first one. So the, the first part is important uh, in saying that uh, according to also the first definition that we saw, when we do participatory research, we have to use some methodological approaches that uh, allow the people to take power that allow people people to take action so th this thing that we were saying before so namely that that people should do research together with you should be facilitated you cannot uh, say to people yeah let's do research together but then you you go on the field and you say okay but i'm using my questionnaire my tools and then you have to, to propose some tools that can be shared and the second point uh, is, is that participant should take control over the research agenda. I mean, it means that you go on the field and you say, okay, I, I plan these steps for my research, one, two, three. And you should be flexible, allowing people to say, okay, let's do three first, because here we are working like this. And, and the, the final part is that participatory research in, involves inquiry, but also action. So people does not uh, discuss their problems, but, but you should bring the, the whole group of people that are doing research. So the researcher and, and the people that be, becomes, uh, I mean, additional researchers, not only to think about what is going on, but, but also to think about to solve uh, some issues. I mean, this final part is maybe less relevant uh, for, for a museum. So I expect that maybe if, if you want to, I don't know, open a, a new, um, basically a, a new frame for your museum and you want to put your research activity in a certain direction, maybe you are not interested of finding solution as an engineer might be. But, but the first two points, I think they are very relevant. So if you want to start the process to use participation in improving uh, the role and the relevance of a museum, uh, and, and you want to involve uh, uh, participation of, of, of maybe your uh, attendees or maybe the, the, the location and the context that you are showing in your museum, you should consider that they need to be part of the museum itself. It's not something that you can do uh, in, in a naive way saying, okay, I involve people, then, then they participate, they give me some suggestions. I mean, as we show before with the letter, this is still participation, but in a framework of participatory research, you, does, you, you don't fully exploit the power of, of this kind of approaches in my personal view. So I hope uh, that, that this uh, first part is clear. And it was just a little bit of definition, which which maybe they are very rough. So so maybe Lucrezia in the, in the second lesson can also give some some more uh, maybe precise uh, ideas about how does participation works in the concept of uh, museum creation and management. And I, I would like now to introduce some examples. And these these are examples which are of course so oriented to the to my research topics, but I think they are quite explicative on, on how you, you can work with these technologies. Just to give some examples, and maybe they are of interest to, for uh, maybe the museums that are showing something that is maybe out from the, the local context. I don't know. I mean, 
I didn't say, but if, if you have question also in between the lesson, please feel free. I hope that is clear so far. So the, the first example that I'm going to show uh, came from some years ago. Um, this is a research I did in Ethiopia, um, researching uh, this that is called uh, a spate irrigation. So spate irrigation is quite uh, uh, an ancient technology, uh, which, which is practiced uh, uh, basically where you have uh, arid and semi-arid climates. And in these climates, uh, you, you don't have uh, perennial rivers. And, and what do you have, especially if you go uh, to the, the most uh, arid countries? Uh, what do you have is that you have basically dry riverbeds where you do have uh, from three to 10, 15 floods in one year. And this is the only water that you get because basically the rainfall is not coming uh, in the plains, it's coming in the mountains and you have rainfall only in the, in the mountains. And then you have this huge uh, amount of waters that flow uh, within some hours and then for the rest of the, of, of, of the, of the months, the, the river is dry. And what, what people does, what people do in this context is to try to deviate water to their fields uh, just basically with, with some uh, civil engineering uh, works uh, which are made uh, by traditional knowledge. So they use uh, materials like uh, uh, sand, stones, um, they can use uh, veg vegetal material and so on. And I mean, in Ethiopia, I would say it is, it, this is a rather a new technique because it is used since uh, some hundred years. But, but if you go in countries like Pakistan, um, basically the, the Middle East, you can find traces of, of this technology some centuries ago. So it's quite relevant, even though um, we develop all our uh, knowledge about irrigation, thinking that the, the rivers are perennials. Um, but you do have a lot of river system that, that have water, but, but they have water only in this way. And there are a lot of people using this technique. So basically you have a lot of traditional knowledge and you don't, you don't have that much of, of structured uh, engineering knowledge. So this is a picture of, of how a traditional spate irrigation schemes, schemes lo look like. I'm trying to make some analysis. So you see this is the river and, and, and this is basically the structure that you, that you have, even if it's just uh, hurt, even if it's just soil. This is made by the farmers and the farmers deviate water. And, and you can also find modernized spate irrigation schemes. This, for instance, is in Pakistan. So there is or there was in the last uh, 30 years uh, the tendency to say, OK, I mean, that's the only water available in this context. So you have traditional irrigation systems that are working, but they, they are still traditional. So I mean, they have pitfalls, they have maintenance uh, issues. So, so why we don't modernize them with uh, some engineered mat material, some, I mean, engineering project approach and so on. And, and they start to modernize the uh, spate irrigation schemes around the world, also in Ethiopia. But, but what we saw, and I saw with my own eyes um, in Ethiopia is that uh, um, the modernization of, of this kind of technology failed. Okay, so this is a part of, uh, of a spate irrigation scheme in Ethiopia that, that was the part of a canal and you see that it's completely destroyed. And, and this is the, another part of a system. So here they 
they basically try to dam the river and to deviate the flood with the dam. And, and you see which was the effect of water, so completely destroying this huge amount of, of concrete. And uh, I mean, this, this diagram is not part of my research, it's just some kind of, uh, of excerpt uh, from, from, from different uh, studies and practical notes made in the area. Um, so it, it is demonstrated that uh, um, during these uh, projects uh, that they, they, they were made in the past to modernize the uh, uh, spate irrigation system, the engineers that, that design these kind of, of uh, systems that, that failed, the ones that we saw a few seconds ago, they had a really low knowledge on, on the physical characteristic of the environments. And they did not even take into account uh, the knowledge and the preferences of local farmers. Uh, these uh, results in, in projects which were practically based on, on equation and, and practices that were used for perennial rivers, not for uh, this kind of ephemeral and intermittent rivers of Ethiopia, uh, resulting in a limited number of successful intervention. And in this area that I study, that is basically in the north of Ethiopia, that is called Raya Valley, uh, there were evidences, quite strong evidences, that traditional spate irrigation system were still performing better than modernized one. Of course, with a lot of issues, but still they were working better because they, they modernized ones, they, they yet uh, higher issues, bigger issues. So what I did with this research is, it was to develop and apply a participatory approach for the design of improvements in these spate irrigation systems. And, and I based my research in two steps. So the first one was an identification of problems. And, and the second one was to incorporate uh, the farmers' uh, preferences and knowledge in design. And, and you see this example, I'm sorry, but, but I just wanted to, to show how this thing can be applied. And, and this is quite a strong application, I believe. You see that, uh, I mean, this is a way of researching the practice and the process that the uh, traditional water management system is, is grounding on. And, and the only way to analyze this, the only way to analyze uh, how water heritage system works and how people manage them, is to use participatory research, is to allow people to explain and to impose their own view over your uh, previous assumption of how the system works. Okay, this is basically I, to make a connection uh, to the course, if, if you maybe want to analyze and show in your museum and not only one water technology, but also how the technology works. It's not you that, that you can show this. You, you cannot uh, rely on, on your own experience, even if you are trained in a specific way. Because if the technology is traditional, people who knows best the functioning, these people are the people that, that are using this system not you. You can study how much you want, but especially in, in, in this traditional system. Of course, I'm not saying that this is true in any case, but for instance, in this specific kind of irrigation, like as many other contexts in the world which are understudied, the people know better how the system is working. So what, what we did in our research is to do this research approach that is called diagnostic analysis. And, and diagnostic analysis is, is basically based on uh, starting uh, from an analysis of a system, uh, analyzing the problems, and then going uh, uh, to a process of, of analyzing these problems, try to see which 
which are the most relevant problems and then to select suitable solution. All this work, you, you can do this work in many ways. So this was only the overall framework. Then we approach this research uh, with uh, um, basically a participatory approach. And, and what we did, uh, we did not study directly the irrigation system. We basically start analyzing the whole agricultural system. We didn't approach people saying, you know, we, we have to work together knowing which are the problems of the irrigation system. But we ask them to explain and to discuss about the overall problems of, of their livelihoods in the framework of, of water management and, and rural practices. And the, the technology that, that we used, uh, maybe so, someone is familiar with this, uh, is, is the so-called participatory rural appraisal. And, and, and this marked uh, one, one very important point also connecting to, to my first uh, introductory slides. So uh, as I mentioned before, you need to use tools uh, that help us uh, um, involving uh, local people in, in a better way, in a way that, that they can not only give their opinion, but also shape the research project. So the participatory rural appraisal at that time, but I'm still convinced today, represented the one of, of the best solution for doing this kind of research. And we are talking about a family of approaches and methods to enable uh, local people to express, enhance, share, and analyze the knowledge, but also to plan to act. The key concept of, of PRA is that uh, uh, basically local people are creative and they can carry their own research. Um, in this in this system, in this in this concept, uh, the researcher should act only as a facilitator and help local people to carry on the system analysis. I, I, I'm not even totally agreeing with this definition because if you act as a facilitator, you, you are actually imposing yourself over the people that are doing research. So basically what I would suggest is that people, they just approach, plan how to do participatory rural appraisal and, and they do it together with, with the local communities. Then, then what, what is participatory rural appraisal in, in a nutshell? So it is this one. So you, you go on, on the field and, and with local people, you try to use uh, uh, qualitative and, and graphical uh, tools to study the system. So you, you can start with a participatory mapping. For instance, we, we were doing participatory maps on the ground and then we take some uh, sketches on, on my notebook and we, we started analyzing the rural system, meaning the village, the river, and the, the, the fields uh, with, uh, with the map. Then you can also start with the transect walls. Uh, that means you start uh, working in the system in one direction and you take notes about the difference and, and which difference. Uh, someone, is someone having some question? Or? Okay, and, and then you can do also these graphics about historical diagrams, so diagrams through which you can show how the, the system is changed. And, and what we did also, of course, I show you that we did uh, basically a diagnostic analysis to discover and solve the problems. Uh, and we did this diagnostic analysis with the participatory rural appraisal as analysis tool. And, and for the uh, design part, that is maybe less uh, relevant uh, for uh, the museum approach, but maybe you, you want to use participatory design. Uh, we use this framework that is just for participatory design, which has three phases. 
an initial exploration of works, uh, meaning that uh, every day you go and, and you discuss uh, about uh, how one system is working with people that was basically based on participatory rulers appraisal. So the, the, the concept uh, is, is quite simple in the end. If you want to do participatory design with people, you should start thinking together with them and, and talking the same language and start uh, understanding and describing the thing in the same way and have, having a common vision of the problem. And this is what you do also with PRA. So PRA, participatory rural appraisal, allow us to do both the analysis of the system and also the first step of the participatory design. Then the second part that, that you have in the participatory design is establishing objective uh, parameters and criteria for design. And, and this was basically what we did with, with the part of the methodology it was the selection of the problems to be solved. And the final part was the prototyping. Uh, so prototyping is, is slightly a different phase. It's the phase when basically you, you start analyzing the system, you decide which are the criteria for the design, then prototyping, basically in the end you do the design, you came back to the people and you say, okay, this is my design, how we, we modify it and so on. But this is only the latest phase is probably the less participatory. I mean, in my approach, it was still needed. And this is basically, I mean, an, an overall uh, description of the methodology. So as we say, the initial exploration of work was basically the system analysis and we did this with, with PRA. Then, uh, we, we analyze the problem, we rank the problem, and we select some solution with the peer array still, but this was part of the discovery process. And then we have the prototyping. Of course, the, you see in the prototyping, the design phase was half participatory and the half not because I needed to make some calculation about what we were uh, doing. And these, these was basically the results of, of my approach. Uh, so you see our, how we were doing uh, participatory mapping. I mean, we, we were discussing with the farmers, then we went on the field, uh, we, we drove some, some sketches on the ground, and then I replicated sketches on my notebook and we discussed it together. We were discussing every day with the farmers, uh, also with some uh, semi-structural interviews, discussing about the problems of, of uh, the system. And, and then we also make a lot of uh, uh, participatory focus group discussing, really discussing the issues to be analyzed. And, and the ranking of problems was quite funny because, you know, when, when you do an exercise of ranking something with a lot of people is quite complicated uh, um, because they, they might have different opinions. So you always need to have a visual uh, support uh, to show how they are ranking the things. And what, what we thought was to basically work with sheets. In, in each sheet, uh, we, we basically draw one problem. And then we ask the farmers to make basically a physical ranking on the ground. And, and it was very su surprising uh, that the farmers immediately reach an agreement on, I mean, which was the ranking of problems. And I don't know, okay, I have some sheets you see here. So this, this is another insight. Uh, and maybe this is uh, a little bit more in the cost context of, of development uh, uh, research, uh, but uh, in, in the beginning, it was a problem because not all farmers know how to read. And this is common in, in many areas of Ethiopia. So what we did, this sheet, they were half uh, drawn and, and half uh, written, of course, in Amharic, which is the local language. And this, the one on, on, on the left is, for instance, the excessive sedimentation on the, on the crops. And, and this, this one was the flooding of the crops, because of course uh, you, 
you need to uh, deviate the water in the in the irrigation channels but then you have some issue when when the water is too much and is, it, it is basically flooding the crops and this is no longer the irrigation that's a flood so sometimes it's difficult to manage so this was the results that we got and you see that uh, um, some problems they were expected so one problem was the weakness of diversion structures and 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 this is link uh, i mean maybe maybe you remember that within spate irrigation what we did is to deviate water with with some structure that basically divide the flow you have the river you make uh, this charge separator here and then you deviate the flow so these these structures are intrinsically weak because uh, i mean the, the power of water is, is really a lot and then we have some issues about uh, lateral erosion so the river was eroding the the river bank and on the river bank of course farmers they have uh, crops so this was a problem but but what we did discover is is problem three and problem problem four so that basically um, farmers uh, were per perceiving not only a problem related to irrigation, but also a problem related to flood security. Okay, so the first two main problems, they were for the structure, but the second two problems, uh, they were for uh, flooding. And, and I mean, I would say, even if I, I didn't want, I don't want to seem so pretending, but but this was really the first case in which researching this kind of, of system, we discovered that a real problem was the flooding. Okay, there is no other, uh, there was not any other uh, analysis about this kind of uh, irrigation system that told us, okay, if you want to make uh, the farmer's uh, life better, you also need to target flood security. And this is because uh, previous researchers, they focused only on uh, the irrigation system without asking the farmers, uh, hey, what is really your problem in your life? Not only in the irrigation. And, and if you think about it, this is another issue related to how much you want to delegate the power of, of research to the farmers. Because in my case, basically, and I'm saying this ex post, it was not wanted in the beginning, but actually starting uh, analyzing the system as a whole, I give the, the, to the farmers the opportunity to uh, talk about other problems besides the irrigation. And, and this was quite relevant because apart from this, this problem about the, the structures, uh, this this problem about about flooding they they much um, overrank the other ones about uh, I don't know the, the size of the structure or the presence of of uh, parasite plant and so on. Then uh, what what we did uh, also because they, they they were no data we rely a little bit on the local knowledge also to understand uh, which which were the. Uh, water levels uh, that that were common in in the systems. So this this was made uh, basically asking to people, can you give us an idea about the average uh, water depth that we might have in some channels and so on. And this co was quite easy because these these communities they they live every day with the river. So it's not just asking uh, maybe to Sarah or Roberto which is the level of the river on average in your city because maybe you don't go to the river every day these people they look at the river every single day because it's from there that the river livelihood came and then the participatory design and and of solutions was made in a final uh, meeting but but in doing this meeting we really take into account all the technical information that were told us by the population so it was not a fully democratic meeting in the sense we we 
really can't afford to give everyone the word, uh, but, but really the information was shared and it was prepared. Basically, we, we knew all these farmers since many months. So this is why it, it, it was short and, and also short. I mean, it was a full day, but it was still short if you compare with other participatory meetings. And, and we basically reach uh, an, an agreement. And for the diversion structures, I, I'm sorry to, to go so much in the technical detail, but I think it's interesting to, to understand how the system work. So basically, I mean, for the diversion structures, uh, which are, I'm moving a little bit forward, this kind of system, we understand uh, from farmers uh, how to design them better and with uh, improved material. So you remember that the diversion structure that they, they were made by the, I mean, real engineers 20 years before they were completely crashed. And, and these were made in, in concrete. So concrete is, is quite a, a rigid material. It means that it's very strong, but if you have a minimum uh, um, movement of the material, it, it completely crash. Okay, so we discussed with farmers uh, and, and, and we understood that they were really capable of working with gabions. So I don't know if you know what gabions are, but gabions are these uh, boxes of, of uh, wire of iron wire that I are filled with stones. And, and there, there were farmers that sell themselves uh, asking you, let's try to use gabions for this kind of, of um, structures, because first of all, we know to manage them. And it's not like concrete. So concrete is not that much used in, in Ethiopia, at least in rural communities. We know how to install uh, gabions, uh, and moreover, they are uh, flexible. So if, if there is a, a very powerful flooding, uh, the gabion system can, can be, I mean, adjusted. I mean, it, it can bend. Also, it is not even impermeable. So some water can pass, and the pressure on, on the wall is reduced. And they also suggest. Uh, to make a very deep foundation because the, the, what was happening by their direct knowledge was that the, the floods were basically eroding this structure from below. And, and of course, then we, we calculated all, all the parameters with, with uh, I mean, some engineering software and we discovered that this solution could really work. And, and basically, we, we did the same approach for the gabion walls. Gabion walls were other structure that we thought to install on the riverbank to prevent erosion. If you are interested, I mean, we, we published a paper on this, and maybe you can share with Sara. And I think this can be also a material of the course. Even though there is a paywall, so don't circulate that uh, outside from the course. And I, I was thinking to show another example uh, from Myanmar, but uh, I mean, th that, that was only in case I go very short with this, which is not the case. So I think uh, we, we are in perfect time if I stop here. I just want to remark. Uh, that, uh, I mean, I'm not blind. I know that in Tigray now, in this part of Ethiopia that I studied, there is a very huge conflict starting two years ago. So as, as a community of researchers working on, on this issue, we are quite uh, um, taking care of this, this situation, even though we can't communicate. I mean, I can't communicate with my friends there, so this was just to make the point about the situation there and and maybe if you if you are not aware about the situation try to get knowledge about this because it, it, it's a kind of a, a hidden conflict so i mean there is a civil war and no one knows that there is a civil war in ethiopia 
and and with this sad thing, I think I'm closing my presentation. But I, I'm I'm very sorry that I need to tell this. And these are my contacts. If you have any information, suggestion, I'm, I I hope this could be useful or at least interesting. Uh, for uh, understanding a little bit what is participation, why is participation contested? So why we have different uh, um, political meanings that people give to participation, how you can do participatory research, what does it mean to do participatory research and, and which tool you can use? Or I mean, you can use participatory tools or appraisal, which is one, but you have multiple. And I, I think I can conclude here, and we can open the question session. Thank you very much, Julia, for your intervention, for your very interesting intervention and your focus on this participatory research, which is really, you, you mentioned